Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to each and every one of you here this morning. If you have nothing else, I'll give you a moment of silence. You can go to God in prayer in your time. Then I'll finish with the invocation of prayer. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. After the bad way we've had, we're so grateful to have good way. We ask that you would continue to watch over these guys that are working, working so hard trying to get electricity back to everybody. We ask that you would just continue to guide them, help them, and keep them safe. As we go forward, this church, Keep your loving arms wrapped around us as individuals and this church as we go forward. We thank you, Lord, for being here with us today, and we ask that you would forgive us for our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Before we back up to the gym, I'm kind of glad we didn't get to the doctor. Okay, we are in Matthew. I know that shocks everybody. So we are working our way through. Uh, we finished the Beatitudes before I got sick, and we're on to the next little section. We're in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to actually start at verse 14. Uh, but I'm going to read 13 just, just so you know what it says. You know I'm not trying to read something out that you don't know. Um, he starts this conversation. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Okay, so that's a verse that I'm leaving out for the conversation, but just saying. So you know. Which brings us to verse 14. Pretty important uh, verse, especially given some of us still dealing with power issues with the You, you, are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel like there's something there we can talk about today. What do you think? We know that there are all kinds of ways to motivate people, right? You want to motivate people to do something? There's all kinds of ways to do it. We can do it through guilt. We love that one sometimes. Or fear. Uh, or even shame. We can shame someone and do something. Oh, so easy, right? But notice when you read scriptures, particularly when you read about Jesus, those are not the forms and methods that he used in motivating people to do what they want to do, right? Jesus motivated him instead through positive messages of hope and encouragement. Consider our lesson for today. Jesus says to his followers, his small band of crazies, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine that for a second? Here is a motley crew of farmers and fishermen, tax collectors, housewives in a tiny and remote village in an obscure part of the world. And Jesus is saying to them, you are the light of the world. Talk about a statement of faith. Let's go further than that, though. <laughs> Talk about a crazy idea, if ever there was a crazy idea. Light of the world. The whole world? That bunch? It must have sounded absurd to them at the time, right? Only Jesus could have seen that this motley crew, God would indeed change the world forever. At the time, though, whew, it probably sounded like so much idle chatter. You are the light of the world. Now do what I want you to do, right? He said that to them, though, and so they were the light of the world. Now, do you want to hear something really crazy? So are we. You and these seats, me and up here, so are we. Jesus says to us this morning, we are the light of the world. Think about that for a moment. Sink your teeth into it and savor it for just, just a moment. You and I are the light of the world. But now, we're going to talk about what that means. What does it mean that we're the light of the world? 
does that call us to do differently, perhaps? For one thing, we need to remember, we need a reminder, perhaps, that with such a great gift, what does the old sign of Phil say? Comes great responsibility. That's right, Spider-Man. Yeah. This responsibility is for the world. That makes sense, doesn't it? Right? If we are the light of the world, a lighthouse steers ships away from the rocks, right? A light bulb lights up the room when there's electricity, right? <laughs> light does not exist for its own glory, but to brighten up the world around it. I want to say that again because that's pretty important, right? Light does not exist for its own glory, but to brighten up the world around it. That's the first thing Jesus is saying to us and to his motley crew gathered there, right? We have a responsibility for the world. I was reading this fascinating story this week about a remarkable young man. He was left blind at a very young age in a childhood accident, of all things, in the 19th century in France. Okay? There wasn't a lot of uh, programs for blind children in those days or in that area, uh, as you can imagine. He really didn't have much help and very little hope for what his future would be. When a particular priest saw him and became enamored with him, he was very intelligent and very thought-provoking. The, the priest really kind of got to thinking about what this kid could do if, if they really had the training he needed and really got to where he needed to be. So priest, uh, Father Jacques, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Paloui, okay, that's my friend for today, uh, Paloui, um, being so amazed with him, he got him a spot in the Royal Institute for the Blind, which is in Paris, um, and he wanted uh, to kind of give him that new world, so to speak. Well, this little boy was, I mean, just above and beyond anything that you've ever seen at such a young age. Here he was at 10 years old, going into the blind institute, already miles ahead of all the other kids, of all the other adults. Like he was just, he really picked up like a little, a little sponge, so to speak. And he was really kind of disappointed. There really wasn't, he wanted to read, and he wanted to read for himself, and there wasn't a whole lot of books in their library uh, for him. And the race print that they had at the time really didn't make sense. It was very confusing and complicated in ways it didn't need to be complicated. And so he really tried to work with them to teach them a new method. He came up with a whole alphabet on his own at 12 years old, 13 years old. Uh, and as you can imagine, they would not even give him the time of day. Too young. What does he know? Don't we do that sometimes to our young people? <laughs> uh, either way, he was not taken seriously. He grew up and became a teacher within the community. He became an organist. If you can imagine that. Uh, I bet he played better than whatever you've heard this morning. Um... <laughs> And yet, they still would not take him seriously for the things that he knew. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the devil we know, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to change. I like what I have now. Is it working? No. But I like it, so we're going to keep it, right? And that's kind of where they were. Though he did not live to witness it, obviously I'm talking about Louis Braille, uh, his alphabet did become the universal method of reading the blind, uh, but it came after his death before they ever really recognized it and made it useful. His courage, though, and hunger for knowledge enabled him to triumph over disability and disease and open new worlds to future generations. Louis Braille uh, became light for those whose physical eyes had failed them. How wonderful it is when a young person sets out to make the world a better place and we adults don't stifle it out. We have some young people in our community today that are doing some amazing things. If we adults will just get out of their way and let them shine. We are the light of the world. We have a responsibility to the world. We also need to be reminded, though, that we have something the world desperately needs. Sometimes we forget that piece, right? That's the second thing that I think Jesus is saying here. We have something the world could not find anywhere else. Nowhere else. Can they find it? There's a great story about Mother Teresa, and she's doing a big convention, and she's talking to people from all over the world, and among the groups to which she speaks is religious sisters of, of different convents and, and, and orders uh, from North America, of all things. And after her talk, she asked if there are any questions, something a speaker sometimes get a little nervous about, but she, she says, are there any questions? And this woman raises her hand, she says, yes, I have one. 
as you know, most orders are represented uh, that ha are losing numbers by the thousands. It seems that more and more women are leaving all the time, and yet your order is attracting thousands upon thousands. What do you do? Mother Teresa looked at her and without hesitating says, I give them Jesus. Yes, I, I know, said the woman, but take the habits. They're itchy and unruly and hot. Do your women object to wearing habits? How about the rules of the order? They're very strict. Do you get off of those rules? Do you kind of make it easier for them? How do you do it? I give them Jesus, Mother Teresa replied. Yes, I know, Mother, said the woman, but can you be more specific? Do you put up basketball goals? Do you have game nights? Do you go to the movies? Is there music that's better than what we can find on the radio? Is communion taste better? What do you do? Tell us. Mother Teresa again says, I give them Jesus. We're all aware of your fine work, says a woman. I want to know something else. Mother Teresa, very quietly, very poignantly, as was her way when she spoke. I give them Jesus. There is nothing else. Hmm. What do we have that the world can't find anywhere else? We have Jesus. How often we forget that piece while we're looking for what others don't have. We are often reminded that we live in a pluralistic world. Today, there are persons of many religious backgrounds who are calling our country their home. And we can learn many things from our neighbors. If someone should ask, though, what is distinctive about Christianity, let me suggest what Mother Teresa said best. Give them Jesus. The greatest heresy current today in all religions are the same. It's not true. They're not all the same. Maybe there are worlds of great religions have something worthwhile to offer. You can help. You can find help in all of them, I think. But what you can't find is that story of a prodigal son, the good Samaritan, the rich fool. There is no higher order in life than that which Jesus taught. Christianity as an institution might not be too appealing at times, might be a little frustrating. The rules that we have created, the things that we have done, the uncomfortable views in which we sit. But if you understand the life and teachings of Jesus, we have the responsibility to the world. We have something the world cannot find anywhere else. And that brings me to my last little reminder for us for the day. A reminder that we are not the source of light. Mm -mm. We are but reflectors of a great source. There is one who has touched our lives and given us power and authority to touch other people's lives. The story of a college professor of sociology who has his class go out into the Baltimore slums to get case histories on 200 young boys. He says to them, I want you to think about where they are now and where you think you can see them in the future as a sociological case. Okay, they all go out, they all do these case studies, they come back, and without fail, every single one of them says to the boy that they interview, he's nowhere now and he'll be nowhere in the future. There is no hope for him. He has no money. He has no parents at home to teach him better. He is in a terrible system. This is his life. He has no better. Well, 25 years later, another professor comes in and says, you know, I'm kind of curious about these boys that they interviewed, and I'm going to send my class out and find out where they are now, 25 years later. See how many of them are correct. Of the 200, 20 had moved away or died, so they couldn't get a hold of them. So of the 180 remaining, 176, so all but four, in case you need some help with math, 176 are found, and they have been found to have achieved extraordinarily successful lives as lawyers, doctors, and businessmen. 
It's not exactly what they expected to find. The professor was astounded and decided to pursue the matter further. Fortunately, they were all still in the area, so he was able to ask each one of them, how do you account for your success? You came from nothing. You had nothing. How did you end up here? And every single reply came with feeling there was a teacher. There was a teacher. There was a teacher, and the teacher was still alive. So he sought her out and asked this elderly but still very alert woman, what magic formula she had used to pull these boys from the slums and into successful achievement. The teacher's eyes sparkled and her lips broke into a big, big smile. It's really very simple, she said. I love them. I loved them. No wonder those boys succeeded. Their teacher loved them. Once, there was a teacher who also loved his students. He saw possibilities in them that no one else saw in them. He saw possibilities in them they did not see in themselves. To them, which the world saw nothing, he saw the light of the world. And so they became the light of the world. The love they received from him, they passed on to others. And today, there is no place in this world that the light they received it from him doesn't shine. Because of fierce persecution, it sometimes is more of a flicker, a faint one at that. Sometimes, because of weaknesses of his followers, the fire is uncertain and tentative. But it still glows. And now, it's in your possession and in mine. We are the light of the world. There's a story of three young boys who are out being mischievous at summertime. They got all the time in the world. Nobody's wanting them home right then. So they're playing around and they see a slow moving train. They think to themselves, I want to get on that train. And they hear each other as young boys tend to do. They get on the train and it's going slow and they're ha laughing and joking and who got on last and who had the most trouble and all those kinds of things. When out of nowhere, the train picks up speed. <laughs> Now it's going about 40 miles an hour and the sun's going down and it's dark and they don't know where the tracks go and they have no idea what's going to happen. There's a little bit of panic, as you might imagine. Then it gets real dark. I mean, then it's pitch dark. There's no lights. They're in the middle of nowhere. They know they got to get off this train because they don't know where it's going. They don't know where they're going to end up. So they, you know, Butch Cassidy it right off the side. You know, they get into the, into the branches and into the mess and they're all scuffed up and they stand up and they have no idea where they are. There is nothing. Can't see their hand in front of their face, but off in the distance, kind of over there somewhere, they see just a tiny glow of light. So their only option is what? Go towards the light. <laughs> you know? So little by little, they make their way through the woods, all the sounds, all the scares, all the squeals and screams and laughter. And they keep going towards that small but very present light. And finally, they get close enough to realize it is, in fact, a small town. There they are, three humiliated joy riders. They begin walking until they get to the roadside restaurant and can call for help. These friends got home safely because they saw a distant light and walked in its glow. It became an overwhelming beacon that led them to where they needed to go. I don't believe that I'm being overly dramatic. When I say there are people in this world who are lost in darkness and they're looking for a light. They're looking for a light that will lead them to spiritual and emotional and mental safety. So, we have work to do. I have to ask you this, how is your light? Is it shining? Could they find their way home because of you? You and I are the light of the world. We have a responsibility for the world and as reflectors for what the world desperately needs. But that means we have some work to do. So I ask you, are you ready? Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift up to you our hearts and our minds. We ask that you fill us with your spirit and make us ready to share your good news and your light with the world around us. 
In your holy name, O oh God, we pray. Amen.